Just lift your hands toward heaven tonight. Hallelujah. Well, if he's here, we ought to rejoice. If he's here, it's time for us to pull down strongholds. Amen. The Bible says if the good man of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake, not suffer his house to be broken into. And Mark does the best job in telling us that once you catch the strong man or the enemy, you bind him. Render him helpless. Make him of no effect, no strength, no power against you. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost here. Of course, I always feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. I, I like to feel God moving, and I, I try to get to where I find out He's moving, and I, I want to I wanna go where He's flowing. Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Samuel, please, chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. Actually, I'm probably going to go down a little lower, Josh, than that. I'm sorry for... I tell you, you, you're a good man putting up with me. <laughs> I'm not easy to follow. It's hard to stay by an outline all the time when God gives you, when the Holy, I mean, you can prepare something and you can write it down, but when the Holy Ghost hits you, you just, I don't call it, well, I, I guess you call it chasing rabbits, but it's a good kind. That's the kind that's spirit-filled, and that's, I like to catch them. Are you there? Say Amen. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? That's coming a long way. This man ran from King Saul for over 12 years. This man was the only remedy that Saul had for a while. Saul was so troubled by an evil spirit. Well, the saddest Two of the saddest scriptures in the Bible to me is one of them is talking about Samson and he knew not that the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. Now that's getting in bad shape spiritually. But the other one to me is and the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit came and troubled him. The word trouble there means tormented or vexed his spirit so that he could have no peace, no rest. He could not sleep at night. So they called for someone to soothe his spirit, and David was the only one that could do it. When David's fingers touched a harp string, Saul would fall asleep. But Saul became so jealous of David that he threw his javelin at him and tried to kill him. Saul, for his life, had a bounty on him, sitting on the same throne, and it back into the house of God, or back into the place of God, where God cut covenant with him. Not once did he seek to enter into God's presence, I believe that there could have been repentance for Saul, but he never sought repentance. In fact, when you read the life of Saul, and you can find it in my books, Surviving the Sifting of God, the last words of King Saul was, I have played the fool. But now he's, David is sitting on the same throne that Saul sits on, and he wants to show no animosity, no unkindness to those that remain. Not only was Saul killed on the battlefield and he didn't do a good job, he tried to commit suicide, went and fell on his sword and he didn't do it. And the very person that God told him to destroy stood on his chest and cut his head off. Not only did Saul lay dead there when he saw that there was no way that he could not only win the battle but keep the throne, the Ark of the Covenant had, been, had, had, had just not been there so they had no divine protection he was on his own and had been for many years but his th other sons three other sons lay dead on the battlefield with him all of a sudden royalty is gone but when you understand this it was the sin of Saul that caused that tumult in their life the Bible said the sins of the, of the fathers are visited unto the third and the fourth generation Two generations are wiped out, and the third one 
is now going to suffer for many, many years before it is recognized and God brings back to his life that reconciliation that he so rightfully deserved and he so wrongfully lost because of King Saul and his malice and his sin. So this is a big step on David's part. And David said, Is there yet any, any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba, and when they called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then King David said and said and fetched him, excuse me, and then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence, and David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake and restore thee all the land of Saul thy father and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. He bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king said to Ziba, called to Ziba Saul's servant and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Now therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Zebel had 15 sons and 20 servants. I want to share with you, I'm going to slow it down a little bit and preach from my heart, not that I don't preach from my heart, a message entitled Living in Lodabar. Lodabar is a place of no communication. It's a place where you are utterly cut off from everything. The Bible wants us to see this because a wrongful act has been committed on someone who didn't deserve it. A misfortune has taken place that seems to be overlooked and forgotten and forsaken. But the Holy Spirit, yes, the Holy Spirit operated in the Old Testament. Who do you think guided that stone from David's slingshot, slingshot to Goliath's temple? What do you think caused an axe head to float after a, bar, a man had borrowed it from his master and was afraid to go home without it? What do you think caused the walls of Jericho to fall down? What do you think caused the Red Sea to part? It wasn't just Moses' rod because that rod was later on called the rod. I could show you all through the Bible in the very first chapter in the first two verses and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. The Holy Ghost has always been evidently present not only in our lives and in the world but in the creativity and the master plan of God for this earth. Now let us make men after our own image. That's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now David is on the throne and there has been an injustice done to someone who wasn't guilty three generations later. And David doesn't understand it, but there's an unrest in his spirit because of a relationship that he has with Jonathan. Jonathan. Jonathan was probably one of the greatest influence other than God because David was the forgotten son himself and he knew what it felt like to be overlooked and forgotten. As a matter of fact, when Samuel came to Jesse's house to anoint the next king to be the successor of King Saul and rule over Israel, David wasn't even considered to be a part of God's master plan and Samuel almost missed God and God said he ain't the one. And after Jesse had filed all of his 
sons that he would claim that he had by legal rights, God said to Samuel, that's not, none of those are the candidates. And Jesse, or Samuel said to Jesse, are these all your sons? He says, I do have one other. That one other was going to change the kingdom of Israel forever and will continue to change Jerusalem throughout eternity. But Lodabar is a land of lost and forgotten potential. Mephibosheth was the third generation of the first king of Israel. He was being groomed. At five years of age, he was already being groomed to one day reign in his father Jonathan's place when Jonathan would retire and step down or, or just part on from the scene. But he was forgotten about simply because of the way the plots of man unfolded and sin found them out and judgment fell on the house of Saul. There's a reason why David and Michelle or Michael did not have children because Saul's household would curse, was cursed. Had Michael had children with David, then God would have been a liar. The son that Micah, David's wife, Saul's daughter, would have become the king of Israel. And there the curse would have remained in Israel and the covenant could not be extended as God planned it from the very beginning. I'm giving you a lot of history here. I'm giving you a lot of story here to help you understand. There are reasons, and the reason I'm telling you that there are certain reasons why our prayers go unanswered. There are reasons why healing doesn't take place. There are oftentimes Satan through disguise and through cover-up and through smoke screens brings things into our lives that we are unaware of oftentimes and it causes us to miss that divine appointment that God has planned for us and we don't do it out of rebellion. We do it simply because we were not aware that Satan was working such mischievousness in our lives. Does that make sense? So Mephibosheth is forgotten. And so he's living in a land of broken dreams. Lodabar is a place of distraction. There is no peer pressure in Lodabar. Everybody in Lodabar is a failure. Everybody in Lodabar has disappointments. Everybody in Lodabar has had some bad breaks. Everybody in Lodabar wants to blame somebody else. Let me tell you something else. I've talked about it for about three or four Sunday nights. The storm going on in Matthew chapter 14. I want to tell you something. There wasn't no peer pressure to get out of that boat. <laughs> Jesus was asking them to do something they had never done before. With no peer pressure. You go first. No, you go first. I'll go if I see you don't sink. I'll be right behind you. That's the way our saints are who are full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. Well, I'll believe it when I see it. When I see you do it and God blesses it, I'll be right behind you. That's not faith. I'm preaching better than you're shouting, and I know it sounds comical, but that's the way it is. So there's no, the Lodabar is that place of distraction. You look at everybody else, and everybody's got problems just like you do, so there's no peer pressure, you know, Nobody's going to make you feel guilty for being there because everybody has lost something. Everybody has messed up somewhere. Everybody has been messed up by somebody it's there in Lodabar. So there's no, you know, there's nothing but distraction in Lodabar because you look around and say, well, you know, I'm, I, you know everybody else has got stuff. I got stuff. You got stuff. We got stuff. Let's just live with our stuff together. And there is no conviction. And it will remain that way until somebody full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost unashamedly and would bold up and say in the name of Jesus this is not right and start correcting the wrong that Satan is sending simply by standing up for what God's word declares that you can't have in your life. Amen. Little bar is the place you live if you've been crippled by the fall. All of us have been crippled by the fall. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us were born into this world, crippled, maimed. Our lives were a mess because Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden and we inherited that same failing, falling spirit in our lives. Amen. Lodabar is a place of dysfunctional life. Something's messed up and you don't know how to fix it. 
Something has gone wrong and it's gone wrong so long you haven't tried to fix it or no one will help you fix it. So you resort to living in a place where everybody else has got problems and nobody will talk about you. There's no peer pressure in Lodabar. It's a place of dysfunctional activity. The, the things that are abnormal become normal. You accept it. It's wrong to be average when God is calling you to be better. If God says, I want you here and you're happy being right here, you, you won't go to hell if you don't come up to here. If you don't aspire to be here, you won't go to hell. But you will never reach the maximum of your potential until you climb out of your comfort zone and say, God, I want more because you have revealed to me. And I'm telling you, word of life, we've had some great services, but we haven't even begun to touch the cream of God's milk and honey until we get in and we come in this house hungry for more of God and say, God, feed me. Let the word of God fall on my life. Life. We'll never see a move of God until we have a passion for Jesus Christ. David said, as the deer panteth after the water brook, so my soul longs after you. Well, I was going to take it easy tonight. Lodabar is the place where people go if their life is incomplete. You ever felt like something is not complete yet in your life? You ever felt like something is out of place? The Bible describes Mephibosheth in, as someone who's lame on both feet. His story is tragic because he could have been and he should have been king of Israel. He was the grandson of Saul, the first king of the nation of Israel. God didn't want a king. God didn't want them to have a king. He knew if he gave them a king, they would look to him instead of looking to God. They would look to the king instead of looking to God. God wanted to keep things as they were. He wanted a prophet that would give them the word directly as God gave it to them and keep them spiritually connected because there's no, listen to this, there's no other way you can be connected to God except through the spirit man. The Bible said it's not by works of righteousness. It, in other words, just doing the right thing doesn't connect you with God. Amen? Jesus, after he washed the disciples' feet, or before he washed the disciples' feet, he said, you call me Lord and Master, and you say, well, for so I am. If I also have washed your feet, you ought to also. With the word all there means you are under obligation. You have a duty. I'm not asking you to do it. I'm telling you the things that you know to do. You are bound by obligation to do those things that you know that you're supposed to do as I have done them. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. Mephibosheth should have been strong and handsome. He should have been a great leader. Now he's living a dysfunctional life. Now he's living where... Everybody else is living a dysfunctional life. Instead of being tall and handsome and a leader, God's man, he's twisted and bruised, incapacitated, and he has been victimized by the sin of his grandfather. It matters what you do as the spiritual leader of your household. And we talked about the men being the priests of the household. I want to tell you something. There's more men, A-W-O-L, than there ever have been. So ladies, I want you to know you have to be the priestess of your household. You have to stand up and you have to put courage under your collarbone and you have to get tough and you have to live the word of God and you've got to tell your children this is the will of God and this is the word of God and now you're going to have to take the posterity of Joshua, choose you this day whom you're going to serve, whether it be the gods before the floods or after but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord somebody praise the Lord you see the the handmaid of Jonathan in King Saul's house in the palace they had gotten word that Saul had fallen dead on the battlefield and so had Jonathan and his other brothers and now the Philistines were coming to take Jerusalem back or to take Samaria, because the whole time, and there, there, there's a great story of this. I'm going to preach it in the future. If you will remember, after, after David cut Goliath's head off, 
Anybody know what he did with it? He went to Jerusalem and he buried that head in the ground because Goliath was their spiritual captain. He was their spiritual general. He was the one the whole time Saul was king. He never sought to get Jerusalem back. But David wasn't king yet. He was just a teenage boy, probably 14 year old. But God allowed him to see through the telescope of time. He realized I'm going to be the king in the future before Samuel ever pulled the oil in his head. He took he took that head of Goliath. He went to outside the gates of Jerusalem and he called out to them. He buried Goliath's head underground right there. And what was a statement, I'm coming back to get what else belongs to God's people and me. I'm not going to be restful until I receive everything the thief has stolen from me. And I'm telling you, it's time we need to bury the sins of the past, the things that has held us back, the things that won't let us get the anointing the things that won't give us peace the things that won't let us rest at night take the devil off your shoulders get rid of shame cry out God give me revival lest I die then you'll see God move I want to scare the devil out of the devil amen broken twisted ankles you see Saul, his sons were dead. The word came to the palace. The Philistines were coming. The maiden picked Mephibosheth up, running out of the palace, tripped, fell. We don't know all that happened, but Mephibosheth was permanently not only messed up, but disfigured. You see this in the statement he gives to David. I'm not worthy. I'm a dead dog. Now to God, or to the, to the Jews, dog was, it was a cuss word. If they called, they called you a dog, they didn't mean that in any kind of way. But to be called a dead dog means that you don't even fit to be alive. You're a pathetic excuse for a human being. That's why he's in Lodabar. He feels like, I have no excuse other than, well, look at me. The word low means no. The word debar means word. So he's living in a place where dysfunctional people live. He's living in a place where there's no communication. Lodabar means no word. You're shut off from the world. Hear me. When Satan attacks you with mistakes and he attacks you with sin and he attacks you with guilt and he attacks you with something that happens to you that's been caused to happen in your life because of someone else's hatred and malice toward you and envy and strife against you, when you resort to live in a place with no word, you get cut off and all of a sudden you feel like I'm this way because I deserve to be this way. That is the attitude that Mephibosheth takes on his life. He's deposed. He's maimed. And worst of all, he's from a house of fallen kings. Saul has fallen. Jonathan has fallen. There's no hope for his future. There is no security coming in. There's no one to say, that's okay, son. We know who you are. We know who was your daddy and who was your granddaddy. We're going to take care of you. That did not happen in Mephibosheth's life. He was taken from royalty, and he was put in a place of absolutely no communication. Now, Jonathan was David's best friend. Jonathan taught David more about covenant relationship than any other man alive. And he had a close rapport and relationship with Samuel. But I want to tell you something. Jonathan saw in, in David what he must have seen in his father, King Saul, when King Saul was right with God. Don't tell me you don't know. You'll know it.
that they use. It will be in their everyday talk. The anointing of God cannot be disguised because it's the Holy Spirit exuberating from your obedient life and you cannot contain it. Listen to me. We don't have a monopoly on the Holy Ghost or we're not supposed to. Some churches and some people do. The Holy Ghost is supposed to have a monopoly on us. We don't manipulate the Holy Spirit. You cannot get the Holy Spirit to work in your favor if you don't know the Word of God to begin with because the only thing that puts the Holy Spirit in gear, I told you that this morning, is when you speak the, the Word of God and that Word of God is proactive to God's will for your life, the Holy Spirit automatically has to kick it in gear, put it in overdrive, and bring into fruition the words that you've spoken by faith. Amen. He was taken from royalty and he was placed in a place of communication and without saying a word he lost his birthright without even doing one evil deed in his life. He lost his birthright. His right to the throne. He lost it all. Amen. Now he's forced to live in Lodabar. A land of silence. Nobody's coming to, to, to pay your bail. Nobody's going to get you out. The cards and letters aren't coming, folks. Flowers aren't. Nobody is going to give you the best meal of your life. You're living in Lodabar. That's where Satan wants to put all of us. Satan wants to make you feel like you live such a dysfunctional life and you're, so, you're just a disgrace for the mistakes you've made. He wants to put you somewhere where you will live in shame and humiliation. And, and the reason he does that, he is afraid if you see what God sees in you, there's no way he'll ever put a muzzle on you and hold you back. You will become the worst terrorist to hell that the devil's ever had in your community. Amen. Think about this. In a flash, he is separated from his father and his destiny. I mean, his father probably kissed him Hugged him real good. And does what daddies do to sons and giggled with him. Put his sword on. Said, I'll see you this evening. But he never came back. Not only did he not come back, but they didn't live in luxury anymore. They didn't have the comfort they had. They didn't have the plentifulness, the bountifulness. They didn't even have the love and even worse, they didn't have security. He was running for his life. All he could do was dream about what might have been. Dream about what should have been. Dream about what could have been. His fall robbed him of his rightful success. He's imprisoned in a valley of regret in a silent place where nobody will ever show up and ease his pain or comfort him in the time of his sorrow. Could have been king, should have been king, would have been king. But there's a problem with his life. He had an area in his life beyond his control. He's dysfunctional, so he is disgraced to the place of Lodabar. Gagged, hopeless, and alone. He should have been in a palace. In fact, the palace that he was now being invited to by King David should have been his palace, his descendants, his 15 sons and 20 servants. Probably would have had more if David had 50 sons or 50 children. How many would, of course, David had eight wives. Every time David got depressed, he got married. That's true. His father was tragically killed. <laughs> I don't know what y'all burst out. I, I can't keep my composure. If Y'all got to keep it together out there. My Lord. Y'all worse than the folks on Wednesday night I have to preach to. No, I'm kidding. His crown was taken away from him. This is one of the saddest stories. In the, his, his crown was taken away from him. He was wounded in his spirit. I love the comeback stories in the Bible. One of my favorite ones is this. Naomi has lost her husband and her two sons. 
her two daughter-in-laws who are Moabites whom she hopes that nobody in Bethlehem ever find out about because when she goes back to Bethlehem with two Moabite daughter-in-laws, everybody in Bethlehem around and says, why are you following me? And then she asks this question. Do I have any sons left in me? Well, if you'll read the rest of that book, you'll find out later on when Ruth and Boaz get connected by the Holy Ghost and they have a son. They bring Ruth's child into Naomi as a wet nurse. She had to have had another baby or that wouldn't have been possible. It's fun to read the Bible and go back and reread it and say, why didn't I see that before? And you get, you know, 50 years later, you find out, well, that's what that means. She didn't think she could, but she did. Hallelujah. If God could touch Sarah when she's 90, surely she could touch Naomi. All, wrong with, all that was wrong with her was that she was bitter. She's just mad. Sour. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara because I'm bitter. I'm mad. I don't want to talk about it. Leave me alone. Shut up. Mind your own business. That's what Mara was. She, named, she put that name on herself. <laughs> he stripped of his crown. Not only, listen to me, not only did he lose his physical abilities, not only did he lose his life of security, not only did he lose his heritage, not only did his legacy mean nothing, not only, his, not only was his grandparent the shame for the rest of his life. Listen to me. The story doesn't end there. When you read the entire Bible, you'll find out that there were other descendants of Saul got killed in battle. And, and basically what happened is they were left out on the field and David would not allow them to be buried because of the evil things that Jonathan's brothers did toward him. And David would not allow them to be buried. But thank God for Mizpah. Mizpah was a fighting mama. Mizpah... She got out there and she went to David and said, would you please just let me give my sons a proper burial? He said, no. So she went out there, got her a blanket, spread it on the rock where they were hanging up, and she got her a stick. And when the lions came and the bears come and the buzzards come, she would beat them off with her bare hand. Don't you touch my baby! It's in the Bible. She had a fighting spirit in the midst of the most traumatic ordeal that was going on in her life. She would not roll over and play dead. I may not be able to bury my son, but I won't let the buzzards get them. I won't let the lion tear their flesh off. I'll let them decay naturally. And if I have to stay here until I drop dead myself, I'm going to take care of what belongs to me. We ought to learn a lesson from that. What we have is still ours. Don't let the devil steal any more from you. thing wrong with Mephibosheth is he's lame on both feet. He's a long forgotten prisoner in a place called infirmity and dysfunction. Now let me hear him say this. Mephibosheth is a picture of you and me. It's so typical. The scenario may be a little different. But the, the actual man the actual attitude, the actual results of what someone else did to you or what something else caused to you. Mephibosheth is a picture of you and me trying to deal with something that is desperately wrong in your life but trying to keep it inside without telling anybody else something horribly wrong is going on in their life. And we all do that. I'm the worst. Mephibosheth is the model of every man who should have been here, but he ends up there. Hello? The reason men end up in Lodabar is because something occurred in their life so traumatic it kept them from reaching out and fulfilling the calling of God in their lives. Satan says, you've ruined it. It's wasted now. There's no way now. We stop short of the goal because hidden in our lives is something we'd rather not talk about. Hidden in our lives is a failure we'd rather no one else knew about. 
the problem is Mephibosheth is no longer five years old. He grew up to be a man with disabilities. <laughs> I, don't know I, had, I don't know how he had 15 children. He must have been kin to my daddy or I must be kin to him. I don't know. 20 servants, 15 kids. Doesn't sound like he's doing too bad. He's a grown man with sons of his own. David called for Ziba. I like this part of this story because Ziba represents what the Holy Spirit does for all of us and in all of our lives. Ziba was a servant for King Saul. If anybody would know the whole story on what's going on in the family of King Saul, Ziba would know because he was over all the servants. David said to Ziba, he said, are you Ziba? He says, I am he. And this is what I like. There's no animosity here. Now, there could be a lot of reasons there. David is now king. If he didn't answer and if he didn't come when he called him, he could have had his head cut off. So when the king calls, you come running. Did you hear that? I'm not talking about David now. You know that, right? When the king calls, you, you say, here I am. So the king called and Ziba out of respect to the office and respect to the king and respect to his own <clears throat> future existence, he came and he said, please tell me, is there anybody left in the household of Saul that I can show kindness to because of his son, Jonathan? Ziba knew all about David's love for Jonathan and Jonathan's love for David. Because many years earlier, Jonathan understood, my father has missed it, the anointing is gone, and David is the obvious answer to Israel's problems. David and Jonathan were linked together with an intimacy that if you talk about two men having intimacy today, you'll get the wrong impression of what kind of men that they are. But back then, when, when innocence was true and pure, David and Jonathan loved one another to the extent that they would give their lives for one another. In fact, Jonathan gave his sword to David saying, I will protect your household with my life if anything were to happen to you. He gave him his robe which says everything that I have in my power and my authority and my royalty I will share with you. We enter into a blood brother covenant together. Ziba says Jonathan has a son. Do you know where he is? Yes. I'm ashamed to tell you and I regret to have to tell you this but he's living in Lodabar. Everybody knew where Lodabar was. Everybody understands what becomes of you when you live in Lodabar. You see, we know that this world is going to hell in a handbasket if they don't get saved, but what do we do to try to get them saved? Because we know what sin does. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death, the Bible says. We have so many people that we love and care greatly for and we know that they're lost and we know that their lives are evil and, or, well, not just evil, but they, they accept evil things into their life which make, takes them deeper into Satan's grasp. And what do we do to try to bring them to the house of God? If we would have a greater passion for people to be saved, this house would be full. People would be coming on a regular basis and these altars would stay full every Sunday when we give the altar call people would come and they would ask and they would cry out. They would be like in the day of Jonathan Edwards when he preached a message entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It is said that the greatest dignitaries of England would grab hold of the pillars of that church and scream is there no mercy with God? And they were so afraid that God would come at that moment they wouldn't have time to pray the sinner's prayer. We need to have a deep conviction for people who are living in a place where, not, where they're not supposed to be living to begin with. We need to show them there's a better way. We need to let them know they don't have to live the kind of life because God's mercy is long-suffering toward all of us. It doesn't matter what you have done. Listen to me. We talk, we talk about people committing adultery. We talk about committing murder. We talk about lying and stealing. The Bible tells us this. But every one of those can be forgiven by the grace and the love of God. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that he takes our sins and he casts them in the, in the depths of the sea and he will never remember them against us anymore. 
He said, as far as the east is from the west, so have I separated you from your iniquities. He says, I have blotted out your sins, and as a thick cloud I have blotted out your, your, your sins and I will, your iniquities, and I will not remember them against you anymore. Who cares what the world thinks if God says, I forgive you? And the world needs to know that. We need to tell people we forgive them. And we need to let people know that God also forgives them. Ziba is sent by David. David calls for Mephibosheth, and Mephibosheth can't come. I want you to see this. He can't come because he's lame on both feet. Did you know, again, Ziba represents the Holy Spirit. And so David says, you know where Lodabar is, and you know what particular cave he's hiding in. I want you to go get him, and I want you to bring him to, to the palace. No man can come to the God who are playing out the role of the Holy Spirit's divine operation in our lives when we are yielded and connected to God by the Word and by the blood and by the Spirit. Amen, somebody. I'm trying to teach you tonight. Zeba goes, <clears throat> Zeba goes, I've taken longer. Zeba goes and he brings Mephibosheth to the palace. And the first thing David says is, do not be afraid. You know, that's what I like about God. In our most dysfunctional state, no matter how bad we've been, no matter how wrong we've been, no matter how much we have opposed the arm of God being extended to us, God always comes to us in peace. I love it when it says, Do not be afraid, neither be thou dismayed. I am thy God. I will help thee. Surely I will strengthen thee. Listen to me. God is a mighty God. He doesn't hold grudges. He's holy. And because of his holiness, we all will be judged fairly because he's also a righteous God. But he says to Mephibosheth, Are you Mephibosheth? I am he, thy servant. He could have been bitter. He could have thought, You, have, you are sitting where I should be sitting. If it weren't for you, I would be there. No, if it wasn't for David, they wouldn't even have a throne for Israel to enjoy or a kingdom for them to be at peace with. But he didn't have that at all. He didn't show animosity. He was humble. In fact, he was so ashamed of his life and his presentation before the king, he didn't feel like appearance-wise that he's worthy to stand before someone in the statue of King David who basically had brought peace and justice and did more for the nation of Israel than any other king that ever lived and sat on the throne in Jerusalem. He says, you're going to move into my palace. You're going to live with me. Everything that your daddy, King Saul, possessed when he died, I'm making, going to make sure that you've got it. And I'm going to require your servants and any other servant that you need to till all of that land. They're going to do it all for you and they're going to bring food in your house and into your warehouses because warehouses are going to have to be built. You're going to have more now than your grandfather Saul had and Jonathan had because the kingdom has expanded since I've become your king and everything that is rightfully yours or was your grandfather's, I'm giving it back to you. I'm telling you, God can restore it. That's Joel 2 and 25. I will restore unto you everything that the canker worm, the palmer worm, the caterpillar, and the locust has stolen from you. All the years, it says. All Listen, there are some troubles that comes to our lives that hone us for years, and it debilitates us. It makes us weak. It takes away our physical ability. And God says, when I declare to bring justice in your life, I'm going to put the years that the Satan has taken off of your life. I'm going to add them to your life because I'm God and because you're my son, you're my daughter, amen. He said, you're going to, but you're going to sit at my table. Maybe there's a reason for David writing, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. When David makes that promise to Mephibosheth, he has to lie on the floor. He's not able to stand. He's lying on the floor and he's laying down and he feels so embarrassed and ashamed because royalty demands allegiance and homage. 
And Mephibosheth is told by King David, you're going to move to the palace. I'm going to give you back your land so that your children after you will have an inheritance and will stop the curse right now. The curse stops here. When you come out of Mephibosheth, that has to be a decision of your own. You have to be willing to come out of Mephibosheth. It's a place of tranquility. It's a place of silence. But when God calls you out and you want to be out and you come out, God changes everything in your destiny. He says, your children after you are going to have plenty. I'll see to that. But you're going to sit at my table. Now, here's the beautiful thing about sitting at King David's table. When Mephibosheth was brought down to the mills, sitting at the table, he didn't look like he had a dysfunctional body. He didn't look paralyzed. He didn't look twisted in mane. He sat there with royalty, and he felt like royalty because he was welcomed in to royalty. I want to tie that with this final verse. We do not have a high priest that cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. We do not have to act like we snuck in under the backyard fence. We got a ticket. We have a right to come into the presence of God. You don't have to let the devil browbeat you. And you do not have to look down your nose feeling like you're unworthy and you will never measure up. Listen to me. Jesus, the, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That word perish doesn't mean that you won't, it doesn't just mean that you won't go to hell. It means that in this time of economic crises, I will take care of you. You will not perish. Amen. Stand with me, please. I don't want to live in Lodabar. I'm glad I came out. I used to sing the song, Jesus signed my pardon. This I surely know. Took my place at Calvary. Now I don't have to go. All my life I'll give to him. He gave his for me. When he signed my pardon, there at Calvary. I've been pardoned. I've been forgiven. I do not have to live where I lived when Satan had me bound by sin and the power of it. God has called all of us out to live a better life. Jesus wants you well. Jesus wants you delivered. Jesus wants you happy, healthy, and holy. And if we will pursue God with that kind of passion and attitude, we will start living the most victorious life we've ever known and be more than a conqueror in his name. God bless you. I love you all. It's been a great day to me. I hope you've enjoyed the day. See you Wednesday night. Brother Edward, would you, would you dismiss us, please, in prayer?